This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Diane Coyle, who's a professor of public policy at Cambridge University, and also the author of multiple books. Um, most recently, uh, a book called uh, Cogs and Monsters, What Economics Is and What It Should Be. Um, also, uh, the author of this book, The Soulful Science, What Economists Really Do and, and Why It Matters. Also, uh, one of my favorites, GDP. Um, a Brief But Affectionate History, also Markets, States, and People, Economics of Enough, and plenty of other writing. Thank you so much for joining me, Diane. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. So, um, you know, your writing, it's, it's kind of, it's interesting because it seems like on the one hand you are very, very critical of economics, or at least you articulate the criticisms of economics very, very well. But at the end of the day, um, you know, you are one of our best defenders. <laughs> you know, you're one of the folks that are out there in the world telling everybody that economics is this wonderful field that's flourishing, that's um, interdisciplinary, that's, that's borrowing the best from other fields and, and putting it together into this melange of, of interesting insights about about the world. And, and so I, I, you know, I'm wondering, right. Um, what is it about economics that provokes so much antagonism, not just in other academic disciplines, but, but also, you know, in, in the general public. And, and I feel like it's, it's partly because we've all ingested, um, economics. We're all economists now. And so, you know, we, we sort of have this, this ambiguous relationship with this thing that we've all We've all kind of turned into, um, and and so I want to you know ultimately go back and, and talk about your time at, at, at Harvard because I think it, when you were at Harvard it was kind of the, the high point of the things that maybe you and I both find to be most limiting about economics. But we've come such a long way since those days. It's a really interesting question you raise, Greg. I um, trained as an economist. I identify as an economist. It's also a subject that lots of people quite rightly have opinions about because the decisions that are influenced by economic thinking and economic advice affect people's everyday lives in really important ways. And so inflation matters, what the Fed does to interest rates really matters to people's um, standards of living. So um, I care a lot about communicating about economics. We can't have this as an internal debate and have to engage with the public. And being honest about what the limitations are of the subject, but also what kind of progress it's made. And as you say in the question, there are lots of critiques of economics. And um, some of those frustrate me because they just kind of misfire. Things like criticising it for having too much math. Well, you know, physics has a lot of math too, and that doesn't mean that you think it's a rubbish subject. But that, that's a tool. And any discipline has models for making sense of a complex world. So economics has models, but so does history and so does um, uh, English or critical studies. So those critiques really annoy me. There's a newer kind of critique that I think is about the fact that the economy that we have isn't serving people very well or not serving a lot of people very well. That um, median wages haven't been going up, people's living standards haven't been improving. Uh, I, I'm not um, on top of the latest US figures, but here in the UK, uh, wages, real wages have fallen for the longest period since the Napoleonic Wars. We've never had a period of such stagnation since the dawn of capitalism. So it's hardly surprising that people are critical about the economic system as it is operating, and I think that that gets projected onto economics. So, so to pick up on the last part of what you were saying, the subject has changed an awful lot. And uh, one of the big changes was reflected in the latest Nobel Prize Award, which was for applied microeconomics techniques and using that to address questions that many people might think were social policy and not to, to do with economics at all. But we've got data, we've got techniques, we've got um, much more powerful computers. We can really make progress in understanding some things about uh, matters of great interest um, to lots of people. Uh, as you say, I was at Harvard in the... Um, early part of the 1980s, it was the high point of 
the um, uh, very austere free market version, rational expectations, markets operate without frictions, the ups and downs of business cycles reflect the fact that uh, wages aren't adjusting properly and if you fixed that everything would be self-correcting. In my day we still had compulsory economic history courses um, but I think they went pretty soon afterwards and so there was a period then when you know actually the discipline became very narrow um, and we might talk about the problems that you and I um, uh, discern there but it's been, that was the, the high point and the tide turned then and it's been changing ever since. So although I think there are things still wrong, things that we really need to improve, um, that that period um, has somehow marked popular perceptions in a way that I, that I think is now um, incorrect. Well, I think it's marked it in a couple ways. On, on the one hand, in terms of methodologies, but, but also right there's this belief that economists have certain normative principles not only about how individuals should behave, but sort of how the you know the the world ought to be organized and, and regulated from a policy perspective, and I think those are kind of both inaccurate descriptions of how economists think in practice. But but um, but you know if we go back to those those time those times, and I, I went to um, I was an undergraduate in in the early '80s and a graduate student in kind of late '80s, early '90s, and. And I experienced a similar frustration with, with economics, um, and it seemed like all the interesting things were being ignored, right? So, you know, I wound up studying history and political science and psychology and history and all these other disciplines. And, you know, while people talk about economic imperialism and how all these other disciplines started copying economics, I, I think it's really more that economics has in ingested uh, so much from these other disciplines. And, and now, of course, you know, we have behavioral economics. I mean, economic history is not quite as popular as some would like it, but, you know, we have institutional economics, right? You know, we have, um, uh, you know, a focus on information asymmetries. We, we have uh, a focus on, on coordination problems. We, we've incorporated insights from evolution into game theoretic models. And so, it seems like economics is kind of a it's, it's a big tent. You can kind of in, ingest all sorts of insights because what economics is fundamentally about is is about right uh, modeling. And I love your example. You say that the ideal model is kind of like the the, the map of the tube, right? Um, and and so why is it what what, what is what does a bad model look like? If a good model is, you know, the, the tube, and remember, the, I guess the tube is not a perfect representation of the world. It's a simplification of the world. And in order to understand the world, you have to simplify it. But what, what constitutes a bad model? That's a great question. And um, so one thing would be that it gets some of the lines in the wrong place without really um, diagnosing what kinds of assumptions underlie the model so you can just you can just get them wrong or you can oversimplify and leave out something um, the world is incredibly complicated and it may be that this the simple models that some economists like to use are just leave out too many important things and one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is um, that sort of implicit um, sense of what causal relationships there are. Mm -hmm. I've been working on well-being policy, the idea that uh, government should target well-being rather than growth in GDP, which makes sense to a lot of people and is uh, becoming more widespread in policy in many countries. New Zealand even has a formal well-being budget. And that stems from research that links certain measures of well-being that are asked in surveys um, econometrically to all kinds of indicators, income, unemployment, um, do you take part in religious ceremonies, are you married, um, you know, do you have to commute, and, and so on. All very plausible things. And um, two things bother me about it as a model. One is that its, um, its measure of well-being is defined by social scientists, and if you ask people in specific contexts what affects their well-being, they won't necessarily, in fact rarely, will they come up with the questions that, that get asked in the surveys. So if you stop and think about 
if you were asked to, to rate on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your life satisfaction? Well, how would you begin to answer that and what do those figures mean? So it's partly what, what, what actually um, constitutes the data because one of my obsessions is that data are not things that are given, they're things that are made, they're social constructs. And then the other thing is all of those correlations are, are quite robust and they've been um, established in different countries, uh, sometimes at different spatial scales, different time periods. But what about what gets left out? Mm -hmm. That your house might flood, um, that the country might go to war. And so it seems to me to lack actually a theory of what drives well-being, which involves much closer work with psychologists than has actually been undertaken so far. And um, so models kind of can get embedded and close down questions about that complex reality that they're trying to represent and influence. It seems like you're taking an approach to well-being that's similar to the approach you took to uh, GDP, right, in your book. Um, and, you know, there is this obsession with, with GDP, and, and not just among economists, certainly, you know, journalists and the general public. Throughout the coronavirus crisis, right, we've been seeing all sorts of um, commentary on kind of what's happening to the economy. And, and when we, we talk about what's happening to the economy, we're generally talking about, you know, GDP. And, and I always found this a little bit puzzling, in part because, you know, all, all of these plexiglass barriers, you know, that's GDP. <laughs> and all of these, uh, you know, vaccines are, are, are GDP. And, and all of the, the testing that happens is, is, is GDP. And, 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 you know, while I guess it's welfare enhancing compared to not having that stuff, um, you know, perhaps if we had no, you know, virus to begin with, <laughs> it would be better off. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, that's just one of the many critiques of, of, of GDP. Um, so, you know, what are we fundamentally missing when, when we focus on, on GDP? Is, is it just that, you know, global warming hits, so we got air conditioning, and then all of a sudden our GDP goes up? Uh, you know, we buy cars that sit on the driveway and never go anywhere, and that's, that's GDP. Is it, is it because of the disconnect between GDP and what we might think of as subjective well-being? Or do the problems run, run deeper than that? It's, it's sort of back to the future with um, economic measurement uh, and the debates between Simon Kuznets and the people who were actually constructing what became GDP um, at, at the, about the extent to which it should be a measure of economic welfare or a measure of um, certain kinds of economic activity and transactions. And we ended up with the latter. But what we really care about in policy and policy making people's lives better is the former we care about economic welfare and things are changing so a measure like gdp that was a poor measure of economic welfare but the extent to which it failed didn't change very much over time so you could look at its growth reasonably as a, an indicator uh, well that's now that's now shifting for several reasons one is that the environmental crisis has become more immediate in its impact and people have been pointing out since the 1970s that um, GDP omitted a lot of environmental externalities and depletion of resources that we really ought to care about. So that's now those chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, another is digital, fundamentally changing the structure of what we do every day, how we spend our time, how uh, companies operate their business models and make their profits which is kind of invisible in the economic statistics. Um, one, but one of the things it's doing is, is shifting activities from one side of the production boundary where they get counted to another where they don't get counted. And those shifts are making it hard to understand what's really happening to productivity and, and people's well-being. So one example I've been thinking about recently is um, those machines in supermarkets now where you scan your own groceries mm -hmm. and put them away yourself. So we've gone from... The old style supermarkets where there's a little bit of capital equipment in the form of a conveyor, conveyor belt and a till and somebody scans the items and somebody packs the bag for you. So it's paid for labour and a little bit of capital. And now we have these machines that are much more sophisticated capital with software embedded that can tell whether you're trying to steal things and we provide the free labour to operate those. And now there are more shops where you... Um, just walk out with things because you've scanned um, a QR code as you go in and we've um, got incredibly sophisticated capital particularly intangible capital and no labour, you just walk out with your goods so the, the, the model the, 
um, production function um, has changed completely and the way those different aspects fall into our economic ca measurement categories means that we, we, we can't we just can't tell whether the productivity has increased or not or whether people's well-being has been increased by this change in the way that we shop or not so, so that's going on as well and then there's the pandemic you know it's been a, a major event and we're going to see for years to come the effect it has on people's um, mental health and psychological well-being um, but we want to think about economic welfare compared to the counterfactual so you can't compare what happens now to what happened in 2019 we're looking at what happens with all the things that we do, including the vaccine and the plexiglass, compared to what would have happened if we were in a pandemic and we didn't do all of those things. So, you know, the policy assess assessment is about counterfactuals in that case. So it's so, a great time to be interested in economic yeah. measurement. I do sense that things are shifting. So, so GDP, on the one hand, is, is it kind of underestimates, right, welfare in some sense, right? If we think about, I just read an article... The computer that I had in 1990, uh, I think it said it would take 560,000 years to mine a Bitcoin. <laughs> and that, that computer cost me $3,000 back in, in, in 1990. Um, and, you know, I know that they, they, there's all sorts of efforts to use hedonic modeling to kind of reflect that. But, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, that would mean that, that that computer would be you know, worth a penny now. I mean, it would cost a penny to compute that, to calculate that. Does, so in some sense, we're, we, we can't possibly capture those increases in productivity. But on the other hand, we, um, we, we overestimate welfare. So as soon as someone goes from doing domestic work to work outside of the household, we see this massive bump in, in GDP, even though, you know, the person's is only doing the same amount of work, right? Um, so is, is it, which is the bigger danger? Are we kind of overestimating or underestimating growth when we think about those two, two things? I don't think it's a unidimensional issue, and so there isn't a single answer that I can give you. We're trying to capture in one number a, a, a set of complicated changes, and I don't really think that can be done. So my halfway house at the moment is to think about... Um, a balance sheet, attach a balance sheet to the national accounts, which is the direction that the current revision of the system of national accounts is going. And then at least we know what's happening to natural resources, um, or, or we can look at different slices through the economy, um, look at what's happening to culture or tourism. You know, you can apply different lenses depending on what you're interested in. Um, and then the other so the other direction to come at it is, is, and it's why I'm interested in well-being, is to start to think more about um, how do people's, how is how are, how is people's well-being affected by things like medical innovations, mm -hmm. and um, the approach there, and I'm working with Leonard Nakamura from the Philadelphia Fed on this, is to think about how people use their time, and what's the value they assign to that time. If you think about um, something like getting your varicose veins fixed then the increase in welfare from the fact that you can go as an outpatient and it happens very quickly and you go home straight away, that's tremendous. And so the productivity gain there is that something that took five days in hospital and a lot of pain is a half a day. Um, but then there are other things like being a COVID patient seriously ill where you really want the eight members of the team in intensive care spending as much time as they can possibly um, uh, spend on you and it's the quality and skill applied to the time that become the metrics there um, so we've all got 24 hours we spend them doing something it's an identity you can't save any of your 24 hours up for later and so trying to parcel out welfare by thinking about time spent and the value of the time spent seems quite a promising avenue but i you know i don't have answers other people may have better answers than this and it's a area of growing interest i think I think your 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 biggest critique in Cogs and Monsters is this idea of uh, kind of performativity, right? And how economists they they often claim to be simply observing the world or interpreting the world, but they're necessarily impacting the world. Um, and and it's not just that they have kind of implied normativity; it's just that the mere act of kind of measuring things is is going to influence. 
the world. An example of that is, you know, GDP. Once we start measuring GDP, it, it starts to become a, an objective, right, for, for policymakers. Yes. Um, yes, so, right. you know, how, how can economists, I mean, if it's unavoidable, then what do we do about that? Do we just have to, to embrace it? I mean, you mentioned Esther Duflo, uh, and, you know, she says economists are, are like plumbers, right? You know, we just, you know, go in there and, <laughs> you know, we know how to, we know how to you know, fix, uh, fix toilets and so forth. But presumably plumbers also kind of know the way a, a toilet is, is, is supposed to work, right? Just like, you know, Keynes said economists are like dentists. I mean, dentists have some idea of what functioning teeth are. Right? They know, you know, this is a cavity. It needs to be, be fixed. But if you're purely positive and, and you don't have any kind of normativity, then, you know, can you be a good dentist? I mean, if you don't know the difference between cavity and, 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 you know, being a bad thing and, and kind of an intact tooth being a good thing? Or, or, you know, are you just simply the instrument of policymakers? This is a, a, a tricky path to navigate. And um, I guess I think the best that we can do is, is try to be um, objective, but be aware of the, of the dangers. And a, a lot of economists are very resistant to the idea that um, that you can't have objective answers, that you cannot discover what works. And so there are the metaphors like plumbers or engineers or dentists. Dentists was Keynes. And um, of, of course, there may be things that we can say are, are true or not true. Actually, I think the ability to identify causal relationships is actually overstated, uh, particularly in macroeconomics, as I talk about in the book, where... Um, you, you, almost always you bring in your identifying assumptions from outside the model, from the hypotheses that you that you build in, into your model. Um, but then there are other circumstances where if you're thinking about what will increase increasing a certain tax due to purchases of certain goods, you can get reasonably um, objective answers to that kind of question. I think it has been damaging that we insist there is no... Um, that, that we are not interested in ethics, that we are just doing the objective stuff, because that's clearly not always true. And it's clearly not always true because, and, and again, especially in macro, you get political debates. You get people who are on one side of the party divide or the other, and they shout at each other. They've got di different arguments about how the economy operates and what policies ought to be. That's not a realm that's objective, and that's the kind of economics that most people see when they watch the news or, or go onto social media. Um, so we want, we want economists to try to be impartial and objective, do the best they can, um, but be aware of the risks and, and the limitations of that. And um, I, I think that's the best. We're never, ever going to be either, um, you know, m moral philosophers um, with a sideline in numbers or, um, or purely objective people who can determine what, what works in all circumstances. Life isn't like that. And, and I think the, the general public has a very skewed view of what, what economists do, right? So, um, you know, uh, if you watch television or read newspaper, everybody's talking about growth and, and, and inflation. And, you know, these are generally considered uh, macroeconomics. And uh, I think in the book, you, you, you say you recount a story where um, some macroeconomist was giving you a hard time for dismissing the entire discipline. Right? And, of course, you, you weren't obviously dismissing the, the entire uh, discipline, you know, what is it about the popular conception of what economists do that is, is so, so inaccurate? I mean, why is it that the public is given this very distorted view of the profession? Yes, yeah, I'm not sure I, I entirely know the answer to that. I mean, it's, it's partly what they see um, on the news when they turn on the TV in the evening. And often it's somebody who works in the financial markets talking about the kinds of things that financial markets are trying to predict second mm -hmm. by second. And uh, so that's the, that's very dominant. And I think a lot of reporters actually themselves don't appreciate that things that they would think of as social policy, um, you know, structuring health care or maybe um, energy markets, that they might think that's to do with... Um, disciplines other than other than economics and I'm not sure we always do a good job ourselves 
at explaining what we do. And um, I've done some work in schools over the years to try to encourage uh, young women to go into economics because it's a very male-dominated profession. And they particularly, well, both they and, and the boys in the class take away the idea that what economics is about is going to work on Wall Street or in the city here and making a lot of money. They think it's about money. And I think that's the dominant perception that people have. And um, money is a metric. We use it quite a lot. Um, but it's n not really what economics is about. Right. Um, but also I think there's this, this perception that um, economists are part of this technocratic class, right, which is anti-populist. And, and you set up in the book, you talk about this divide between – you know the 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 populists and, and the technocrats and the technocrats are always advocating for things you know like free trade and you know they have certain beliefs about what is is good for the for the economy um, or at least that's that's the perception is there is there merit to that i mean you know you mentioned that when you were in university there was this kind of consensus around the 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 reagan thatcher kind of free markets uh, approach to things. Um, and, and I think that that's probably if, if, if most people, at least in the popular political domain, were to think about what economists favored, they would favor, you know, as much free trade as possible. And, you know, they oppose the minimum wage and, and, and so forth. But, you know, as a, if you're, if you're purely in the positive domain, then all you, you would do presumably is say, Hey, if you do this, this is going to be the consequence, Right. It's, it's kind of like um, during the whole COVID crisis, we, we've had epidemiologists, you know, an epidemiologist, technically all they should be doing is saying, you know, if you do this policy, you will get this result. But ultimately, right, they're not the ones or at least shouldn't be the ones that are making the, the policy decisions. Why, why do we think that, that economists, do we think they're more normative than they really are? Is, is, or, you know, are economists necessarily going to be you know, required to come out with some kind of normative position in these debates? I think we often fool ourselves as economists by talking about this concept of economic efficiency. And so um, generally, if you're working in economic policy, you have, you've been socialised into a, a way of thinking about the world, which is that you start from the assumption that markets work well. And there's a series of assumptions behind that which don't often get queried. And um, you might look for a market failure where a government intervention can make something happen better. But then, as you say, you'd often end up with diagnoses like um, uh, we should liberalise trade because freer trade is better, uh, or we should not be really cautious about increasing the minimum wage. And um, because that's... Well, first of all, that's seen as a, a, a reform, a good thing to do, and it's a good thing to do if you're ruling out any consideration about distributional changes between different groups of people, because the concept of efficiency that we use is a very bizarre one. It isn't like an engineer saying, this is the most efficient way to get the oil through the pipeline. It's, this is um, a situation where nobody can be made better off without somebody else being made worse off. But my goodness me... There's no public policy environment or context in which you're not talking about making some people worse off. You can't judge between policies if you're not prepared to do that. So this sense that, you know, we can say this is a, a, a good reform to do if only the politicians would implement it, that means it's a really bad analysis, something that can't be imp implemented because it will harm too many people in a political constituency is never going to get implemented, and it's not a good way to do the analysis. So... Um, so I, I, I do think we, f we fool ourselves in that sense. Uh, I, I've kind of slightly lost my train of thought there. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, think, well, I think one of the points in the book is that, you know, welfare economics is really not something that's taught anymore. And, and it's not considered to be, you know, a, a major part of the e economics discipline. But in a way, you know, we're all kind of doing welfare economics. We, we just kind of pretend like we're not. I mean, I think that's that's kind of what you're saying and maybe we should yeah. you know be more explicit about it and and actually you know re revitalize that field and and bring it out into the open why do you suppose well what happened to welfare economics why did this kind of disappear as a as a as 
the mainstream part of, of the profession? I'm not sure why. It's a very good history of thought question. And um, I was taught a little bit of it as an undergraduate by my fantastic um, tutor. Um, but the key texts uh, even now date from the late 1970s. I don't think there's anything, any substantial classic welfare economics text since then. And it's absolutely ready for a reboot. We're going to hold a workshop on it with some colleagues in Oxford and the LSE later this year for that very reason. And um, one of the urgent reasons for needing this is actually the way the economy has changed. You know, I just mentioned a, a moment ago that the, um, the way that we interpret efficiency depends on a series of assumptions. So the presumption that markets are better than anything else depends, among other things, on the assumption that there are constant returns to scale in the economy, that people have fixed preferences, that they don't influence each other in their choices. And these were not good assumptions. These were not empirically good assumptions at the best of times. And they are less and less true in the economy now. In a period of innovation, it's ridiculous to talk about fixed preferences. And the whole of Madison Avenue, of course, is built around the idea that you can um, uh, manipulate people's preferences. And so we're, we're seeing all these new goods and services emerging. And uh, the extent of the increasing returns to scale in the economy is now phenomenal. It was always true with aerospace or autos, um, but it's now true with pretty much every startup where the, their services, a lot of the assets are intangible. Um, almost all the upfront cost is going, going to be fixed cost, and there are huge increasing returns to scale. So the digital platforms come into the market and they want to, they want to conquer the globe. Um, because that's the way that they'll, they'll get their average cost down as far as possible. So we need a different kind of benchmark framework, which is about um, an increasing returns to scale, social economy, everybody wired together by social media, and um, think about what does welfare economics look like in that context. And actually, I think we have to jettison a lot of the um, apparatus we have now for thinking about it. I mean, it is weird when you think about it. You start your undergraduate economics, and you're shown an indifference curve, and it's all about utils. I've never seen, seen a util in the wild. <laughs> and, um, and then we stop thinking about it. You just grow so used to thinking in those terms that you don't interrogate it anymore. And yet things like monetary policy depend on looking at inflation rates, which are calculated on the basis that that's the price change that keeps utility constant of some disembodied consumer halfway between this year and last year. It's, it's actually very weird. Well, isn't behavioral economics sort of uh, a foundation for a new welfare economics? I mean, behavioral economics is usually concerned with individual choice in, in a very narrow setting, but, but they do have some kind of implied uh, welfare claims, right? The idea that, you know, when people are acting and they're making decisions, I don't think a behavioral economist is shy about saying, hey, you know, that person is, is doing something that is contrary to their best interest or it is contrary to their kind of, you know, true long-term preferences, right? So, so in a sense, they're, they're doing welfare economics. They're just doing it at the, at the micro level. So is what you're calling for perhaps incorporating the kind of welfare notion into a new macroeconomics? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, there are some good things about behavioral economics, and including in particular the acknowledgement of social influences and social norms, and that's really healthy. I've got two reservations about it. One is that it's still got this assumption about true long-term preferences. It's just that we don't know them. There's an economist in a white lab coat who knows better than we do what's good for us, and, and that does trouble me. Um, and the other is that I don't think we actually know when the behavioural assumptions about behaviour operate. And I've been much influenced by something called biological markets theory. There's a load of experiments that are showing that pigeons, rats, fungi, any natural entity uh, which is trying to maximise its access to energy under constraint acts like the perfect um, economic agent in the rational expectations model. And that says to me that there's something about understanding context to understanding how people behave. Um, I loved the book Scarcity a few years ago by um, Sendil Mernanathan and Eldar Shafir. And they 
um, really focused attention on how much bandwidth people have when they're under stress um, from poverty. And where they're focusing their bandwidth, they are incredibly um, maximising and rational. Um, but that means that they don't have the attention to think about other things and act irrationally in other ways. So I, I would want us to understand much better um, the, in, the importance of context before embracing anything from behavioural economics totally. Well, you, um, you mentioned in the book this idea of reflexivity, and I, I wanted to dig into that a little bit. I mean, the example that you use, sort of a canonical example, was you know, the options markets and how right, as soon as the Black-Scholes model was developed, uh, all of a sudden you'd see the prices in the markets kind of converge <laughs> around what the model says that, that they're going to be. So you know, when, when you start making predictions about the world, the predictions actually become self-fulfilling to some extent, um, how pervasive is this? I mean, is it, and and to the extent that it is pervasive, what does that say about the kind of responsibility of of economists or social scientists in general? Oh gosh, that's a big question. Um, I, I I think it's more widespread than is often realised. And um, Bob Schiller's book on uh, narrative has some other examples from macro. Um, the self-fulfilling character of a recession um, would be one example. So financial markets have many um, great examples. There's, um, slightly outside of economics, an example like the Y2K bug, the millennium bug, if you remember, when we, we expected that um, nuclear power stations would explode and planes would fall out of the sky when the clock turned from 1999 into 2000 because of the way the computers had been programmed. And that didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was because it was self-averting. The fear of it had led computer engineers to put many, many person hours into sorting out the problems in the code. And it, as it turned out, there were very few problems. And, uh, you know, I guess as media saturate our lives through people spending hours a day on social media, the scope for more of those self-fulfilling and self-averting phenomena is becoming ever greater. Um, and I sometimes wonder about about data, the data economy. And there's a lot of interest in understanding how to value these assets, which um, you know companies clearly prize greatly, uh, affects their stock market valuations greatly. But what is a unit of data, and how do you begin to price that? And if you look at even quite well known examples like personal credit data, they don't list prices. You can't go to the website and say. Uh, 10,000 records, that'll be X, you have to ring up. And that tells me, as a former competition regulator, that they are testing what the market will bear. So um, there's this, there's market power there. But it could be that somebody will come up with a formula for pricing um, data records. And if they do, my goodness, I think that market will converge on, on whatever formula. Um, because Because it is so rootless. And then that enables the market to grow. The options market was minuscule before we had the Black Scholes formula. But I mean, I think if if you're evaluating somebody for credit and your model says that they're you know a, a bad credit risk, you're going to charge them a higher interest rate, which is probably going to make them more likely to default, right? And so the the expectation becomes somewhat self fulfilling. And and I think that the 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 more worrisome part about this are the assumptions that we make about humans, right? So you mentioned public choice, right? So public choice is is meant to be purely descriptive, and it's a model which says, hey, you know, bureaucrats are interested in, in, in maximizing their self-interest, and politicians are interested in maximizing their self-interest. And, you know, it's possible that these, these models themselves may have led to politicians becoming more self-interested. Um, and, and some people argue that economics, the economic way of looking at the world, causes people to become more more selfish and, and more individualistic. Um, I know the evidence is a little bit mixed, right? People talk about how economics majors behave differently in ultimatum games and, and so forth, and it's not clear whether that's a selection effect or, or a treatment effect. Mm -hmm. But do, do you think there is this, this broader impact uh, about how the, kind of the economic view of the world undermines maybe the social fabric in, in, in some way? Uh, or, or is that kind of overstating the impact of, of economics? 
I don't know. I think in public services, um, the the what you know the new public management approach, as it would be called in the public political science literature, has been counterproductive and has undermined intrinsic motivation. And um, that's because, you know, paradoxically enough, um, there is truth in the basic public choice idea that doctors and nurses and public servants are all humans too, and so they will respond to human incentives. If you then incentivise them by setting targets, you know, how many kids in their class get certain grades or how many people they pass through their hospital in a certain number of hours, then then they'll respond to those incentives. Um, so that loss of intrinsic motivation, I think, has probably happened. But that doesn't undermine the, the truth of the insight. And, you know, this makes the task of... Um, policy economics just much harder because you need to put yourself in your model and scrutinize yourself at the same time that you're scrutinizing everything else and it's surprising how often in, in policy recommendations there's just even a basic lack of recognition that the people to whom you apply the policy will respond <laughs> that it will change their incentives one of the great examples is a behavioral economics one and it's about the way that you change road layouts um, by ending the demarcation between where the pedestrians go and the bit where the cars drive and so that makes drivers more cautious and these experiments were tried in some cities particularly in the netherlands they worked really well and then people get used to it right. and revert to their old behaviors it's the, you know it's the old risk compensation mechanism and it applies here as much as it does anywhere else it probably applies in the way that people adjust their behavior um, as waves of COVID come and go and it's a pretty basic lesson in policy analysis, but it seems to get forgotten so much of the time. Well, it seems like that kind of thing could be predicted, right, through experiments. Uh, you, you mentioned the role of the economist as kind of a, a lab technician. But, but on the other hand, you also talk about economics as something like, you know, Darwinian evolutionary theory or geology, where, where causation is something that's, you know, really very difficult to discover through experimentation so what is the what is the role how much what can we what what is it about causation that we can realistically expect to um discover and and what of it is is going to be more like geology where we're um you know we're basically just presenting models and those models have to be convincing kind of based on on what we see and not what we actually discover through experimentation I think for um, small, small questions um, uh, or um, where you can triangulate evidence, then you, you can get a handle on causation. It gets harder the bigger the question you're tackling or the, the bigger the scale. In macroeconomics, I'm not sure that we will ever finally get causation any more than we'll ever know what the true underlying causes of the Second World War were. There will always be a debate about that. But the, that you have to try to bring to bear as many different kinds as, of evidence as you, as you can. And economic history actually is a great source of identifying material for uh, macroeconomics. But then there may be other types of questions, um, those classic policy questions like what should a tax rate be? Um, or uh, what is the effect of a particular intervention like introducing a regulation been, where you can get a much better handle on on, on causation, on, ca on causal questions. And um, I don't want to stop asking big questions because it's hard, uh, but I would like us as economists to pay more attention to other um, insights from other disciplines, um, from people who think differently to ourselves, you know, that basic intellectual hygiene thing of talking to people who disagree with you so that you understand why you, why you might be wrong. But I suppose my ultimate dream is that um, we manage to make economics consistent with the human sciences and so that what we learn is consistent with what um, biologists learn or geneticists learn or epidemiologists learn or sociologists and um, we should all as the human sciences be looking at each other to see are there contradictions there or can we learn something from the way that other people interested in the same questions are looking at the world well you know a lot of the folks that I talk to on this podcast, a lot of the economists in particular I talk to, they, they would agree with you and they would agree with uh, Danny Roderick, uh, who says 
to be a true economist, you know, you have to read a lot and you have to read from a lot of different disciplines, right? You have to, you know, read some biology, read psychology, read history, you know, read political science. But this is not how you're trained as, as an economist, right? Uh, when you get trained, you, you, you go through this kind of very narrow funnel, right, where, you know, you're your reading is highly constrained and, and limited, and there is this thing which you refer to as kind of you know mathiness. Um, is, is that is that a, do you, I mean is that inevitable? I mean, look, gr- graduate school is graduate school, right? It's all about becoming highly specialized. It's all about you know understanding some little thing really, really, really well. I mean, is, is that unavoidable? Um, is that inconsistent with this idea of being highly interdisciplinary? How can you be both interdisciplinary and be a contributing specialist in in your discipline? Well, I think the system is broken. I, you know, I, I do agree with you absolutely that if, as a graduate student, you have to f- focus in on a, a question that's manageable and you narrow down and you have to learn special skills, technical skills. Um, but then we seem to keep the, the tram lines very narrow after graduate school as well. And early career researchers know that they need to publish a certain kind of article uh, with certain kinds of technique in certain journals if they're going to get the jobs that they want and the promotions that they want. So that's then five or ten years of their uh, intellectual career where they're having to stay as narrow as they were to get into and and through graduate school. Um, People better than me have written about the tyranny of the top five journals, bunch of Nobel laureates have pointed it out. We don't seem to be able to get away from it, but it is a tyranny. I just think it's madness that departments want to hire people who've only published in, in five journals when it takes years and the competition is so stiff. And I've seen departments hire great people and then throw them away after three years because they've not met these artificial deadlines. It seems absolutely insane to me. And um, that it, it's um, pushing many people out of the academic profession because idealistic young people come to social sciences including economics often and stay in graduate school because they want to make the world better Uh, they could have gone into the city or wall street and they haven't and um, the idealism gets beaten out of them by having to operate in this way i find the resistance to all but a a certain kind of modeling and techniques particularly strange for a discipline that claims to be so empirical I've started doing qualitative work using surveys, um, semi-structured interviews, um, natural language processing, and um, economists like the high-tech stuff, so they like anything to do with machine learning, or if you program it in Python, that's fantastic. Um, But they're really unkeen on interviews. And yet, you know, to go back to the causality question, if you want to identify what's happening in a market going to talk to people who participate in the market is a great way to find out about it and you have megabytes of data it's just text and you can analyze that in a very systematic way so why um the top journals are resistant to qualitative methods is just kind of inconsistent and and so you know you use this term uh, mathiness and and you mentioned that when people are kind of in the early stage of their career and they're um, encountering economics for the first time a lot of people are kind of turned off by this, right? And so, you know, the core core micro class will just push away a, a bunch of people. But, but, but isn't that isn't that sort of the the point, right? To force everyone to adopt this uh, way of modeling and and using a common language so that they can um, evaluate and and test the, the different theories that the people are generating. To what extent is this kind of a straw man? I think you, you mentioned that a lot of the critiques of economics are, are kind of straw men. Is, is that a straw man to say that economics is is too mathematical? The, the mathiness term is Paul Romer's originally. Um, and I'm all in favor of mathematics uh, and very much against the mathiness. It, it's, what's the you difference? have to have the mathematics what's, what's of the, the purpose. Um, it, the the kind of um, you know advanced topology, which is really um, not very good mathematics as opposed to good economics. There are um, there's no interest in economic intuition in that, and 
learning different fixed point theorems so you can prove the existence of general equilibrium in different ways. You know, really, what is what is the point of that? That's the mathiness of it. But um, you know, using if you're doing a marginal analysis using calculus um, or using algebra to set out the logic, it's really about logic of your model and test for internal consistency. I don't have any problem with that at all. So can you imagine a day where someone could get a PhD in economics w without uh, you know, a huge amount of, of, of math? It's, it's kind of hard to imagine in, in today's world, right? Uh, I think it's still hard to imagine. I, I think if you want to do economics, you have to have quite a, a, an appetite to do some mathematics. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned that we're uh, seeing a new political economy emerge. Now, when I think of political economy, I think back, you know, the old authors of political economy texts from the 19th century, you know, it, it wasn't highly mathematical. It was very much uh, almost a, a literary discipline, something closer to what we might think of today as, you know, sociology or anthropology or, or, or political science. Um, do, you, do you think that a new political economy would, would look substantially different from you know, what we see today in economics, what would that look like? What, what is, I mean, I think your, your argument is that economics is changing and it's evolving. Um, where is it headed? What's it, what's it going to look like in, in 10 years? Well, I'm thinking of things like um, reintroducing questions of economic welfare and distribution, and they can't be purely mathematical questions. Or to give another example, um, the dynamics of online markets mean that they tip you know uh, platforms grow very slowly but then at, at a certain point they grow very quickly and they become the dominant player and you've got a kind of schumpeterian competition if if the competition's possible and in those circumstances uh, if you're a competition regulator and you're looking at a, an acquisition or um, an abuse of dominance in european legislation then you any 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 decision that you make either to let the acquisition go ahead or to stop it, is going to shape the market. So your decision will shape market structure. And this is very different from kind of old-style competition analysis where you, you take a market structure as given and you define its boundaries and you're looking at a short-term time horizon. So the dynamics mean it has to be about what kind of economy do we want. Do we want one where this big American company comes in and takes over um, this particular sector or do we want to stop that happening and we'll wait and see and maybe uh, a British or a European company will grow to scale in our market instead. So that's that has to be political and I think um, it is changing but I also still uh, see that there's quite a lot of resistance among economists who think of themselves as plumbers or engineers who, who step back from industrial policy as, as that might be called. So I'm with, I'm with Danny Rodgers. Yeah, well, you also mentioned that digital is different, right? And and I think, um, you know, there are certainly folks in economics that would say, well, you know, all we're seeing is changes in the cost function, you know, information is cheaper, right? I mean, the, 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 the argument is that it's more uh, continuous than discontinuous. But I think you, you sort of fall down on the discontinuous side and say, hey, what's happening right now in, in the world is, is, is so dramatically different that we need a completely different set of tools to, to understand it. Um, I mean, how much is it, how much of it is just, you know, the more things change, the, the more they stay the same. And, and why should we think that the changes that we're seeing out there in, in the world and the economy are, are sufficiently disruptive that they're going to cause a, a disruption in, in the social sciences and the way in which we interact with the world? When I got interested in digital in the mid-1990s, I talked to a very eminent economist about it and um, about um, the implication of moving from dial-up internet to broadband, um, well, you know, which was on the horizon. And, and he said to me, well, we know how to handle that in our models. It's just a small reduction in transactions costs, so what would be different? And here we are spending four hours a day online with a completely different um, market landscape than we used to have. So I am in the discontinuous camp, and um, it changes market structure. It's led to um, polarisation in firm profits and productivity, with a top 5% pulling away. 
market power on both sides of the market, including the labour market, and um, the different way that we need to analyse employment conditions and wages in monopsy, monopsy markets. And um, it changes thinking about economic welfare, and it means that we need to understand intangibles far better than we have so far. So we've got a, a, a glimpse of intangible value through stock market valuations for listed companies, but pretty much um, everything is intangible now. One of my favourite papers ever was by Zvi Grilikas in 1994 in the American Economic Review. Uh, he taught me a bit of econometrics back in the day and was wonderful. And the paper said, um, uh, we've got some measurement problems because more and more of the economy is becoming hard to measure. And he found that the hard to measure bits of the economy had grown from just um, around a half in 1945 to more like 60% being hard to measure. And I would say we're now at 75% 70, hard to measure because the concepts don't fit. You know, I, I work on productivity. What is, a pro what is productivity when there is no product? You're not going to count the productivity of a management consultant by the number of slides right. in their PowerPoint deck. So how do you do it? Yeah. Well, and I think we, we're going to have to obviously come up with new metrics. But um, you mentioned that in some economics departments, the divide between kind of new ways of thinking and old ways of thinking have been so severe that they've even resulted in splits, right? And people who call themselves kind of heterodox economists. Is, is this a thing or is this kind of just a, just, just a blip? Um, are, are there certain ways of thinking that, that economics is just so resistant to that there's going to have to be kind of a, a new type of economist that's going to detach themselves and, and create a new discipline? Or are you fundamentally optimistic that economics is a big enough tent that it's going to evolve to incorporate all of these new insights? I think economics will change. A lot of the energy um, is going in that direction. I, I'm less sure whether all economics departments themselves will be able to change because they're trapped in a bad equilibrium and it's hard to bring about that kind of system change. So they might stick to their top five journals and, um, and narrow approaches to small questions. Um, so I, I don't know how that will play out. I, I find it interesting that people who call themselves heterodox economists are just so angry about everything that economists do and, and you know can't see any of the good things that we've been talking about and I don't identify myself as heterodox but I guess if you talk to many mainstream economists they would certainly put me on the edge of the tent if not outside the tent. Well I think the title of this book The Soulful Science I think if you didn't co if you covered the bottom part and you asked people what this book is about very few people would think it's about economics, but I think you do a great job of explaining why economics does now have a soul, uh, and it's thanks in part to the work of you, Diane. So thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Gods and Monsters. It's been a great Gods and Monsters, Soulful Science. GDP, so many wonderful books. Appreciate for joining me. We'll talk again soon. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.